Hello, and welcome to Chapter 10. Chapter 10 covers two sample tests. That is, you're trying to compare the population means or population portions of two different samples. You can either do that where the samples are paired, that is, they're repeated measurements on the same people, or independent samples, where it's measurements taken on two completely separate groups. Now the problem that I'm going to cover is problem number six, which covers the first case. We're looking at the difference in population means between a before test and an after test. This would be a paired sample because you're measuring a before and an after and looking for that difference. Now the cool thing about these paired tests is that they're not really different from the one sample t-test we did in the previous chapter. Let that sink in for a moment. Because instead of looking at comparing the mean of before with the mean of after, what we do in each case is we just calculate the amount of improvement, and we test if that improvement is equal to zero. And so let's begin. I'm on page 393 in the textbook. We're going to need the top formulas for the confidence interval, the bottom formulas for the hypothesis testing, specifically for the test statistic. Suppose a sample of 49 paired differences, okay, 49 is going to be our sample size, n, randomly selected from a normally distributed population, we need that normality because we're using a t-test, yields a sample mean of d bar is equal to 5.9. So in this sample from the population, the average improvement is 5.9. This is a sample. We're using the sample statistics to learn about the population. We will never know the population. We will never know the mu of the population or the sigma of the population. But we can use our sample to estimate those. Here we've got a d-bar, a sample mean of 5.9, and a sample standard deviation, s sub d, of 7.4. And we're using lowercase s to indicate sample standard deviation. And the d in the subscript is for these differences. So first, we're going to calculate a 95% confidence interval for mu sub d. This mu sub d is the mean in the entire population. This d bar is the mean in our sample. We're trying to learn about the population based on our sample because we will never ever know the population. Can we be 95% confident that the difference between mu1 and mu2 is greater than 0? In other words, can we be 95% confident that mu sub d is greater than 0? In other words, since we're looking at a 95% confidence interval, is that entire confidence interval above zero? If so, then yes, we can be confident, 95% confident, that mu sub d is greater than zero. Otherwise, we can't. So part A, confidence intervals. Let's hop over into Excel. Let's bring the information over from the problem to Excel. First, given that n, the sample size is 49. We're given d bar is equal to 5.9. We're given S sub D is equal to 7.4. We're given alpha is equal to 0 0.05. Wait a minute, you may ask, where did we get alpha is 0 0.05? We're asked to find a 95% confidence interval. 100% minus 95% is that 5%. Now, I'm looking at the top of page 393 in the book and the confidence interval from use of D. And that confidence interval requires us to know D bar we got d bar, good. t sub alpha over 2, so that's the next thing. I'll call it t mult, which is because it's really just the distributional multiplier. We also need to know s sub d, okay, we got s sub d, and n, and we got n. So we got everything once we get this t mult. So this is actually equal to t, because it's the t distribution dot INV because we're asked to find the quantile which is the inverse of the T distribution if we had T dot DIST or T dot DIST that would give us a, pro a probability T dot INV gives us a, 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 a T value and dot 2T because we want it to be two-tailed confidence intervals for us are always going to be two-tailed now if we look, we need to get a probability. That probability is alpha. And we need a degrees of freedom for one sample cases, such as this, because we're looking at just the improvement for one sample. 
this is going to be n minus 1. This is going to be 49n minus 1. So the multiplier is 2.01. So the lower confidence limit is going to equal d bar minus that t multiplier times the s divided by the square root of n. Now look at the formula we just did in Excel. Compare that to the formula at the top of page 393. And the lower confidence limit is going to be 3.77447. Upper confidence limit is going to be exactly the same, except we use a plus instead of a minus. So this is going to be d bar, our point estimate, plus that t multiplier times that, whoops, this is going to equal d bar times that t multiplier. Nope. Oh. Fingers not working the way I want them to. This is going to be d bar plus, there's the plus button, that t multiplier times that s of d divided by the square root of n. So we are 95% confident that the true difference in the population is between 3.77 and 8.03. Now we're supposed to round these to two decimal places. So let's go ahead and reduce that. And there we go. 95% confident that the true mean in the population, that true mu sub d, is between 3.77 and 8.03. Always put the lower first. Since we're 95% certain it's between these two values, and that's all greater than 0, we're at least 95% certain that's greater than 0. So yes, we are 95% certain that the difference between mu1 and mu2 is greater than 0. So that's A. Confidence interval. Here's the formula in Excel for the lower confidence limit. Here's the formula in Excel for the upper confidence limit. And compare those with the formula at the top of 393. And so that's the end of the confidence interval question. The next question, part B, looks at calculating the test statistic. And I know this is a test statistic because it's just t is equal to. There's no subscript on the t. Test the null hypothesis that mu sub d is equal to 0 versus the alternative that it's not equal to 0. So this is a non-directional hypothesis. There's no direction to the alternative. It's in both directions. It's also called the two-tail test. By setting alpha equal to 0.1, OK, so alpha is no longer point. So it's, there's alpha, uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001, OK. So how much evidence is there that mu sub d differs from 0? So let's calculate the test statistic first. I'm going to look at the formula at the bottom of page 393. And it's the test statistic is t is equal to d bar minus d naught all over s sub d over root n. So I'm going to, going to make this into a numerator and a denominator. Then I'll have the test statistic. I'll put the test statistic there. So the numerator is d bar minus d naught and we're told that d naught here is 0. Denominator is s sub d divided by the square root of n, the sample size. So the test statistic is just the numerator divided by the denominator. 5.58108. We need this to three decimal places. 5.58. And I put it in the wrong place. There we go, 5.581. Now I need to determine when we would reject. So that's a test statistic. So we need, conf uh, we need critical values. So we're going to do, th which critical values are we going to do? We're going to do one associated with alpha equals 0.1, alpha equals 0.05, alpha equals 0.01, and alpha equals 0.001. And again, it's two directional. So let's go ahead and do some critical values. And we'll call this one 0 0.10. 
and that critical value is going to be equal to t dot inv probability of 0 0.10 oh but we are doing this as a two-tailed or as a non-directional so it's going to be five percent in each direction and the degrees of freedom are going to equal n minus one oh that's a negative so we need to make that a positive we can either preface this with a negative sign or use the ABS function which stands for absolute value so if the test statistic is greater than 1.67722 we would say we would reject at the 0.01 level I'm just gonna copy and paste oh that's right we do this equals t dot I and V. Again, the probability is going to be this alpha of 0.05 divided by 2. We can write it that way. Degrees of freedom is again going to be n minus 1. Oh, let's go ahead and put a negative sign in front just to save on typing. So if the test statistic is greater than 2.01063, we would reject at the alpha equals 0.05 level. And degrees of freedom is 48. And again, you could either do a negative or an ABS. So if the test statistic is greater than or equal to 2.6822, we would direct at the 0 0.01 level. Ah, we forgot that negative sign again. The P, if the test statistic is greater than 3.50507, we would reject at the 0 0.001 level. The test statistic is 5.58. It's greater than all of those. So we're going to reject at all of those levels. All test values, which means it's extremely strong evidence that mu1 differs from mu2. So to pull from this, this is how we calculate the test statistic. This is how we calculate the critical values using Excel. We compare the test statistic to the critical values. Since we rejected at the 0 0.001 level, we say it's extremely strong evidence. And that's part B. And finally, let's look at part C. C is looking at a p-value, so which means that we're testing a null hypothesis. Here, the null hypothesis is a less than or equal to. That means that the test is a directional test, which means you really do have to pay attention to this H sub A, this alternative hypothesis. The direction of that is a greater than. Okay? So we're given that the p value for testing this is 0 0.0043. Hmm. Let's see if we can come up with that 0 0.0043. Now I'm going to get rid of those critical values don't need those we do need this test statistic so this oh but now we're testing it for three instead of for one so we need to change the numerator from b2 minus 0 to b2 minus 3 denominator is still s sub d divided by the square root of b and this test statistic is still the numerator divided by the denominator so the test statistic is now 2.9 see if we can get that p-value of 0 0.0043. p-value is a probability. Here is a probability of a t-distribution, so it's t. And it's not just a t-distribution, but it's a probability that that t-distribution is greater than, greater than because that's our alternative, is greater than that 2.74342. So this is going to equal to t dot dist, Oops, didn't want to do the parenthesis yet. We've got some options here. We got t dot dist, we got t dot dist dot two t, and t dot dist dot rt. T dot tis, t dot dist dot two t gives you that two-tailed probability. Now we're not dealing with a two-tailed test. This is directional. Back in B, it was two-tailed. Here we're dealing with the direction. In fact, we're going to be shading everything to the right. 
because it's greater than, greater than is shading to the right. T dot dis dot RT is the T distribution probability associated with the right tail, RT for right tail, and that's what we want. Just to make this clear, T dot dist by itself is the left tail. So T dot dist is the probability of a less than. T dot dist dot 2T is a probability greater than and less than. And T dot dist dot RT is the probability of greater than. We need X, which is our test statistic. Degrees of freedom, which is 48. There's the p-value according to R. It looks like connect rounded it to four decimal places. So let's go ahead and round this to four. Zero, zero, four, three. So that's how connect got its p-value. Uh, so let's need to calculate that test statistic. It's 2.743. The p-value is 0 0.0043. That was given to us, and we actually just calculated it for fun. So we're going to reject h naught at alpha equal to at alpha equal to anything greater than 0 0.0043. Which of these values are greater than 0 0.0043? Well, the 0 0.1 is, the 0 0.05 is, the 0 0.01 is, and that's it. 0 0.001 is less than. So we rejected at 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01, which means it's very strong evidence that mu1 and mu2 differ by more than 3. Evidence that mu1 and mu2 differ by more than 3. Differ by more than 3. And that's the end of part C. And so here's what we did with this problem. Which problem is it? Chapter 10, problem number 6. We were given a what's called a paired t-test. But I showed you that a paired t-test was exactly the same thing as a one-sample t-test on the differences, which means that we need the sample mean and the sample standard deviation from those differences. Here, the difference sample mean is 5.9, and the standard deviation is 7.4, given to us. Move that over here. 49 is our sample size. D bar is 5.9. Standard deviation is 7.4. You will, of course, have different values. Then we need to calculate a 95% confidence interval for the difference. We calculated that using the format at the top of page 393, which required us to know what D bar was, what that multiplier was, that distributional multiplier, and what S, D, and N are. This distribution multiplier, since it's a confidence interval, we're going to use t.inv.2t, 2t because it's a confidence interval, we're looking for that 95% being in the middle. We need to give it a probability. That probability was 0 0.05, not 0 0.1. 0 0.05 because the confidence level was 95%. And the degrees of freedom is going to be, for this one sample test, n minus 1. And that gave us the lower and upper bounds. Let me change this alpha back to 0 0.05. That gave us the lower and upper bounds of 3.77 and 8.03. We're 95% confident that the true difference is somewhere between 3.77 and 8.03. Now, since both of these numbers are greater than 0, that means that we're at least 95% confident that the true difference is greater than 0. And that was A. In B, we had to calculate the test statistic. The formula for the test statistic calculation is at the, at the bottom of page 393. I broke it up into a numerator and a denominator. The numerator is d bar minus d naught. We're given d naught is equal to 0. The denominator is equal to s sub d over the square root of n. And so the test statistic is just the ratio of the numerator to the denominator, 5.581. Then we calculate all those critical values. And we discovered that even with a critical value of point, uh, corresponding to a t distribution with alpha equals 0 0.0001, we rejected. So we're rejecting at all test values that were given to us. 
which means it's extremely strong evidence that mu1 differs from mu2. And that was b. c repeats a lot of what we did in b, except now, instead of alpha is 0 0.05, alpha is 0 0.1. We're given mu sub d is greater than 3 for our, for our alternative. That greater than tells us that it is a directional hypothesis. And that greater than is going to be important. And now this 3 is our d naught. So instead of 0, it's going to be 3. That gives us the test statistic of 2.743. Connect gives us what the p-value is, but we calculated it ourselves. Remember the little talk on t.dis.rt? And it's dot .rt because this is greater than. If this was not equal to, then it would be dot .2t. And if it was less than, it would ju just be t.dist. That requires the, the test statistic, which is 2.74, and the number of degrees of freedom. We found out that the p-value is indeed 0 0.0043, which means we're going to reject at alpha levels of 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01, because all of those alphas are greater than p. But we fail to reject when alpha is 0 0.001. Since we reject at 0 0.01 and above, we say it's very strong evidence that mu1 and mu2 differ by more than 3. That mu1 and mu2 differ, that's what that mu sub d is, by more than that's what the greater than sign is, 3. And that's what that 3 is. So this alternative hypothesis is really what we conclude. Hopefully this was helpful. One sample t-test seemed to be a little bit difficult, but we've just talked through it. Good luck, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email. Take care.